Hello and welcome to Dialogue. A recent report released by the UN Conference on Trade and Development says monetary and fiscal policy moves in advanced economies could lead to a global recession and prolonged stagnation and could inflict even worse damage than the 2008 financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. So how serious is the situation and what has caused this economic downturn and what can countries do in the face of a possible recession? To discuss these issues and more, I'm glad to be joined by Dr. Richard Causal wright Director of Division on Globalization and Development Strategies, UNCTAD, Dr. William Lee, Chief Economist of Milken Institute, and Ma Chang, Associate Professor of Finance in Fanghai International School of Finance, Fudan University. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to the discussion. Uh, so Richard, I will start with you. Uh, we are seeing a possible recession, prolonged stagnation, even worse damage than COVID-19 shock and 2008 financial crisis. How serious is it this year or next year? Yeah, it's, it's very serious for sure. I mean, there was a slowdown that was almost inevitable coming out of the big bounce back from the COVID recovery. So that there was a, a, a slowdown in a way pre-programmed into the global economy. But, uh, but there's, there's a perfect storm brewing with a lot of uncertainties, a lot of uh, financial vulnerabilities, particularly in developing countries. And we worry that because of the policy choices that are being made in, in uh, some of the major economies, particularly the rapid tightening of monetary policy to solve their own inflation problems, then that could have a very profound ripple effect across the global economy. Uh, countries have been uh, piling up debt before COVID hit, uh, a number of countries in the developing world were already under serious stress before uh, COVID-19. And as, as their uh, cost of servicing that debt increases, as the dollar strengthens and they have to pay back in dollars, as the export market slows up, as, as global exports uh, slow up, then there's a real combination there that spells trouble for a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, William. Uh, obviously, it's not only the developing countries. You can see some of the developed uh, economies, like uh, you know that of the UK, Germany. You know where, uh, because of the Ukraine conflict and the energy shortage, you see even some of the industries either they are closing their factories, for example, in European countries, or they are migrating to places like the United States. So the challenges uh, is quite widespread, let's say. Yeah, the, the post-COVID environment has been hit with a, a trifecta of, um, of, of shocks and a perfect storm, as Richard said, uh, that is just quite uh, unique. Uh, this, the demand, excess demand that's driving inflation, not just in the advanced economies, but around the world and globally, especially uh, uh, with, with, with uh, supply side disruptions that come from uh, the, 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 the deep, deglobalization process, as well as supply chain disruptions caused by the war in Ukraine. And then on top of that, the, the huge amount of geopolitical uncertainty that is affecting the world because of the war between Russia and Ukraine, which threatens to, to spread into other, other parts of the world that are also political hotspots. And so you see that the advanced economies are, are trying to, to control this inflation, which not only disrupts the world uh, in the advanced economies and, and causes difficulties for families to live within their means, but in the emerging markets, it's really a choice of, do we have starvation or not? because the supply chain disruptions, especially the food supply chains, has, has destroyed safety and soundness of supply chains that these eco emerging economies had so relied on. So, so the policies pursued by the advanced economies to control inflation is not just to benefit the larger economies, but also helps to ensure that their supply of restored in grain energy that feeds the emerging markets as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ma Chang, you know, it seems, according to a report, like uh, a soft landing uh, seems more and more unlikely. Uh, is that so? Yes. So as the world economy is experiencing a very special moment. In the aftermath of COVID-19, we see inflation hit many countries. That's number one. Number two, we also see geopolitical crisis between Russia and Ukraine. That's number two. 
Number three, we see there's increasing amount of climate risk that's hitting the whole world, number three. And we see some signs of political instability and social unrest around some uh, regions, that's number four. And plus what Richard and William mentioned, the monetary policy tightening cycle is hitting many other countries. So all these shocks, I have to uh, mention that each of them can create a damaging uh, uh, effect on the world economy, let alone we have all of them together. So that really makes the jobs for policymakers extremely challenging these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so Richard, you can see there, you know, there are multiple challenges, uh, but of course, you know, the interest highs in developed economies, in particular in the United States, by the Federal Reserve, that they're creating a stronger dollar, you know, that leads to more problems for uh, vulnerable uh, developing economies over there. Um, but then, you know, what else can we do if we say uh, in the US would say we have to raise interest rate because we are facing this soaring inflation. Uh, you know, fighting inflation is the priority for the US, for the UK or for the European economies. Um, is there any way somehow they can make some uh, readjustment about their poli monetary policy, for example? Well, so we would argue they have to be much more cautious about their use of monetary policy. Not that they should not use monetary policy, but they have to be more cautious. I think you have to ask yourselves, what are the origins of inflationary pressures in the advanced economies? Um, I, I think we would argue they're coming much more strongly from the supply side. Cost of energy, the breakdown of, of supply chains are the origins of it. I think our worry is that central bankers in these countries still seem to think we're back in the 1970s when the pressure on uh, for, a, for increasing prices came particularly from the wage uh, the labor markets uh, we, you had a wage price spiral in the in the 1970s you had, the pressure was coming from the demand side it made sense to some extent to use monetary policy much more aggressively in, in under those circumstances that's what paul volcker did as head of the fed in the late 1970s. That's not the situation that we're in today. There is no wage price spiral, no evidence for a wage price spiral. Uh, that doesn't mean that there was a case to be made for a gentle rise in monetary policy, uh, uh, interest rates and a tightening of monetary policy. There was. But to tackle supply side problems, you need other measures. You need to use strategic price controls. You need to use uh, uh, taxing of windfall profits. Some of these energy companies are making incredible profits out of the uncertainties in their, in their markets. And, and, and that's feeding through to household uh, uh, expenditures. You need to use these kinds of measures, I think, much more aggressively to tackle the problem without causing a hard landing. I think, as Cheng Ma said, the danger is that we don't have the conditions for a soft landing, and, 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 and we need to be very conscious of that when we're designing policies. And I think the kind of policies in place now are not only going to be bad for developing countries, for the reasons we've talked about, I, I think they'll be bad for developed economies as well. So a much more pragmatic, a much greater mix of policies of what is needed to solve the problem without, without making the, the, the prescriptions worse than the disease. Mm -hmm. uh, William, you know, do you think, you know, take the US for example, uh, besides raising interest rate, uh, other options are being pursued by the government or by the Fed Reserve? Let me amplify the point that Richard made, which is absolutely spot on. I just come back from conferences at the World Knowledge Forum in Korea and our own milking conference in Singapore. The one consensus at all of these conferences and, and, and analysis around the world has been that inflation comes in different forms in different countries. In the United States, there's too much demand and monetary policy is addressed toward reducing that demand. In the European economies and much of the Asian economies and emerging markets, much of that inflation, Richard rightly says, is from the supply side because of disrupted supply chains and also the war in the Ukraine. And, and that requires a different sort of policy mix, which is much more uh, structural and, and fiscal policy to try to subsidize the the, 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 the the poor families that are being affected by these high prices. So, so I think the different policy mixes of different countries are called for because the source of the inflation is very different. And to get to your question um, about the United States, right now, monetary policy is bearing the brunt of the attack on inflation. And, 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 and again, maybe to a wrinkle on the U.S. perspective on wage price spiral, the one thing that Chair Powell is trying to do is prevent 
the 70s from recurring again, prevent a wage price spiral, because there's already signs in this tight labor market in the United States that wages and prices are starting to spiral out of control. Inflation expectations are, are at the risk of being unanchored, and that's the one sign that so the Fed cannot allow to happen, because that would worsen the inflation problem, not just in the United States, but around the world. And the policies that would be used to address uh, inflation on top of monetary policy would be, as, as Richard said, higher taxes to try to restrain demand and also supply side uh, taxes, uh, tax policies to encourage more production, especially production of gasoline and energy in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, Ma Cham, you know, William has made the point, obviously, you know, different countries, the situations are different. Uh, for example, in Asian economies, including China, Japan, South Korea, uh, their inflation rate is not that high, it's not that a big problem. But in European economies, the U.S., you do see the inflation is probably too high uh, for the central banks not to take any action. Uh, so do you see like different economies are taking different policies uh, to deal with this, uh, probably their own specific problems here? Yes, indeed, we see that different countries taking different policies to tackle uh, their domestic econo economic issues. For example, as William Richard mentioned, for the United States, they are, they are using monetary policy to, to tackle the inflation uh, by many other advanced economies as well. But for UK, for example, the, they are discussing their recent fiscal plans to, to sort of uh, tackle the similar issue. For Asian countries, for, for example, in China, we are uh, actually easing monetary policies to tackle the domestic economic uh, issues. Indeed, to summarize, uh, different countries have its different economic situations, so they have to adopt uh, different uh, policies to address this issue. But one thing I want to add into this discussion is that there will be large spillover effect from advanced economies to emerging market economies. We know because we are living in a global uh, financial system that dollar is a dominant currency. Whenever U.S. raise their interest rate, that will generally spill over economies to emerging markets through capital flows to through global financial market. That will constrain those countries' monetary policy spaces. Therefore, uh, I, I think the policymakers should be more open to use other, pol other policies together with monetary policies to tackle with their domestic uh, economic problems. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Richard, you are suggest suggesting you know, some other non-monetary policies. Uh, uh, you know, how difficult it is probably for governments like, uh, you know, uh, European economies or the U.S. to make some moves to ease the inflationary pressure by probably doing something about the supply chain, for example. Well, I, I mean, as you said, you said, some countries are already doing this. Germany, for example, just announced a huge package of, of measures uh, to directly address the, the, ten, the tensions that households and firms are facing. And, and many of the policies we, we suggested were quite common across the advanced economies in the late 60s, early 70s. Richard Nixon, after all, in the early 1970s, uh, introduced price and wage controls. Hardly, hardly a radical U.S. president. Um, so, so these, I mean, these, these, are, these are policy choices. These are political choices. As much, they're not technical choices, in, in, my, in our opinion. I, I, just in response to Bill uh, Williams' important point, I, I think we have to recognize that the Fed has a special role in the global economy. We, we live in this very dollarized world, and we don't have a global central bank as such. And the nearest we come to that is the Federal Reserve. And, and the Federal Reserve cannot simply make policy decisions purely based on its domestic uh, 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 situation. It has to be conscious, as, as Chiang Ma said, of the spillover effects that it can, its decisions can have on much more vulnerable economies. The U.S. benefits hugely from the dollarized world, huge, huge financial benefits to the U.S., and it needs to take those into consideration when it's designing its own policy response to specific domestic challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, William, what's your response? You know, the Fed Reserve has also has a role, not only to the U.S. economy, but also to global uh, economic situation here. Yeah, in my uh, 12 to 15 years at the Federal Reserve before joining the IMF, I, um, the, the, the staff was always engaged in trying to understand 
the repercussions of U.S. monetary policies around the world because it feeds back onto the U.S., quite frankly. And, and, and the one thing that we have to keep in mind, though, is that each central bank can only address policies that are that is mandated to do. The ECB is mandated to have price stability in the euro area, full stop. The Federal Reserve is mandated to have full employment and price stability in the United States, full stop. And bank, you know, and similar for every, every other central bank around the world. Um, and, and, and the coordination that goes on is to keep an eye on what happens to the exchange rate. As the dollar starts to strengthen, yes, it helps the US on the inflation front, but it's a disaster for emerging markets and, and dollar indebted countries. And, and, and one thing that US provides are swap lines and financial arrangements so that countries that are temporarily at a short of dollars and cannot pay their debt can use these swap lines and, and borrow the dollars to tie them over to, to, to ensure that the global financial system is intact. So a lot of the policies that are used to handle the spillover effects are structural policies and regulatory policies that try to strengthen the global banking system, strengthen the financial markets around the world, and, and really to ensure the supply chain is functioning. And, and that's where the emerging markets, especially China, has a very special role to try to make sure that as globalization shifts and, 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 and restructures itself, to be able to ensure the safety and soundness of the supply chain as it reforms itself. Those structural policies are the key to, to enabling emerging markets to survive this disastrous period right now. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Richard, back to you here. Uh, I think William has made a, a point here. I think that's a legitimate point because central banks probably will be responsible only for their economy. And it's difficult probably to ask them to also take care of the rest of the economy, for example, for the Fed. Well, it's true. Of course, the Fed has a dual, a dual responsibility for uh, uh, containing inflation and maintaining full employment. Uh, that's different from the ECB. So it, it has itself a, a wider mandate. And as William said, they've already introduced swap lines as a way, uh, as a reflection of the fact that the, the Fed decisions have, have uh, ramifications beyond the United States. Of course, the problem is those swap lines are very selective. Brazil has a swap line. Argentina doesn't have a swap line. And, 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 and that's the problem of, 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 to some extent, of seeding uh, uh, monetary uh, global monetary policy to a single, albeit a very important, uh, Federal Reserve. And, you know, in that context, we would argue that there needs to be a much greater role for a, an institution like the IMF in terms of generating liquidity uh, across the globe and, and coordinating policy. But uh, we would argue that the International Monetary Fund has never had the resources or the, or the full mandate to do that properly. Uh, that, and we think that's a real weakness. But, but there is clearly an inconsistency between having a, a national uh, a central bank with the kind of uh, power that the Fed has uh, operating in a, a, in a global system which is heavily dependent on the currency that that, that uh, single central bank um, issues. So, so there's a real tension there. And I think the only way to handle that tension properly is to look for multilateral mechanisms that can do the job uh, in a less, I would, I would say, in a less politicized way. I think that would be the language I would use be, because the, Fed, the Fed's decisions are, are not global, but they're, they're driven to some extent, I, I think, by, by geopolitical decisions, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Geopolitical situation. Uh, much harm. I mean, there's this uh, interesting question here. I mean, on one hand, you can argue the Fed Reserve, of course, is responsible for the U.S. situation. They will do what they need to do to keep the inflation down. I mean, you, can, you cannot blame them for doing that. But on the other hand, when they hike the interest rate, there's a spillover effect. There's a real effects on the vulnerable economies. Uh, it's kind of a dilemma. Uh, what's the solution to that? Yes, so you actually raised a very tough question. So indeed, by mandate, as William point, uh, point out, the Fed is only responsible for its own uh, domestic economic issues, which is uh, uh, inflation and maximum uh, employment, right? But on the other hand, we live in a globalization world. Whatever Fed do will have spillover effect to emerging market economy. But what's more, the Fed should also realize there will be spillback effect because we are in a general equilibrium world, what ha whatever happens in other countries will also feed back to the United States, which put could potentially hurt the due mandate the Fed has. 
Therefore, I think the policy coordinations between the Fed and other central banks is extremely important. And there, therefore, that creates a role for the IMF to, to really, and also the BIS potentially, to really have the central banks uh, sit together and then see the problem and then coordinate their policy. And by doing so, I think that's the only way out to solve this problem in this uh, extremely uh, uh, uncertain world nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, the um, Rebecca Greenspan, uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary General of the UN CTAD said, there's still time to step back from the edge of recession. Uh, it gives us some hope, like uh, there's something we can do to avoid this uh, worst scenario. Uh, but I also, as you mentioned, uh, there's uh, probably uh, whether there is a political will or lack of a political will. Also, much I mentioned the coordination among central banks. Then it reminds me of the 2008 financial crisis. You do see G20, for example. The governments were working together to save the global economy. Are we seeing any signs of, um, you know, governments doing that? Um, yeah, we don't seem to be having the same kind of London G20 moment that, 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 as you rightly said, was an important response to the <clears throat> financial shocks in 2007 and 2008. Um, we have the IMF uh, World Bank meetings starting next week, and it will be interesting to see how they, um, <clears throat> the, how they respond to the current uh, situation. Um, it's, I mean, I think, as everyone has pointed out, this is a difficult geopolitical moment. There are, there are serious tensions uh, in the global uh, political architecture that make, for, for, make it difficult to find consensus and to build the kind of coordination uh, that, we, that we need. But having said that, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the circumstances are such that I think there is a growing recognition that we can't continue with business as usual. I, I think that's that's clear. We have not only we have the IMF World Bank meeting starting next week, the following month we have the next COP to deal with the climate challenge uh, that will take place in, in Egypt. And, you know, behind all these challenges, I think, is the need that we need to have a stable financial system and we need to have a financial system that is able to deliver significant amounts of investable resources. The only way to solve the multiple problems that we're talking about is for countries to invest in the right ways. And one of the points that we've tried to make in this report is that we, we essentially have an, it, it might sound a little funny to Chinese uh, listeners, but we have an investment crisis in the global economy. Most countries are underinvesting and have been doing, particularly since the global financial crisis, but even before the global financial crisis, we had, we had rates of investment were not sufficient to deal with the kinds of problems that most countries are facing. And I think, I th and, 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 and in that context, I don't think rising interest rates are particularly helpful because they, they, they choke off investment when we need more investment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so so um, we hope that the kind of, pressures that many countries and not just developing countries are under will kind of bang heads together a bit harder in the in the in the international uh, community and come up with more effective solutions than the ones that we've been seeing over the over the last decade Pr the the there were big promises made after the global financial crisis and there was a huge there was the the london conference that really did uh, provide solutions immediate solutions to the the panic in financial markets, but it hasn't persisted. It hasn't continued. The promise of reforms petered out. And by the end of the last decade, uh, it was clear to us, at least in Angtan, that we were already facing some very, very serious problems in the, in the governance of the global economy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Richard, you are suggesting we need to push forward for more necessary financial reforms in terms of the global financial system. Uh, what are some of them? I mean, can we do that? Either well, I mean, one of the good things that came out of COVID nineteen, I think, one of the, was the was the issuance of a large amount of special drawing rights, which is the reserve asset that the the IMF um, uh, can can issue to its members. Six hundred and fifty billion dollars was the was the sum that was issued last August. The problem is that 
Um, because the allocation of special drawing rights is based upon the quota system, the, 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 the countries that need special drawing rights the least to face any sort of balance of payments and liquidity problems get the most of it. So, so the advanced economies got a huge amount of those special drawing rights and the countries that needed it the most in the developing world who were facing serious liquidity problems got the smallest amounts. And there's a big debate going on now in the IMF about whether we can reallocate, how we can reallocate special drawing rights to countries that actually need them. And, and that's a positive thing, I think, a, a sign that there is genuine concern about the need to reform some of the practices uh, in, in, in the international architecture. The one big issue that I think they need to talk about, and the report does talk about extensively, is how you handle sovereign debt problems. This is an old issue, goes back to the foundation of Bretton Woods, and we've never found a system at the multilateral level to make sure that we can deal with sovereign debt crises in a less punitive way than has been the case uh, to date. And that's become all the more important, I think, in the last 10, 20 years, because it's not just um, uh, bilateral or multilateral debt that has increased significantly. It's private debt that has increased, that has mushroomed over this period. And the need to bring in private uh, uh, in, uh, uh, lenders into this story is a real pressing problem. And I think it's something we can only handle properly at the multilateral level. So, so we hope the debt issue will now become a big focus for attention in the international community, because if we don't solve the problem, we're not going to deal with the, uh, we're not going to provide the sustainable development goals. We're not going to have the investment to meet the Paris climate mm -hmm. targets. There's some real big problems that need to be solved, uh, and 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 getting debt right is one of the biggest of all. Mm -hmm. uh, William, uh, Richard also mentioned about lack of investment basically around the world. Uh, do you agree? Uh, lack of investment, of course, in developing countries is easier to understand. Uh, what about the, the developed world? There's also a lack of investment? In the advanced economies, the zero uh, interest rate policies that have been in place for so long have distorted the allocation of investment so badly so that essentially anything looks like a good investment project when you have zero rates. But having higher rates, the advantage of that is that it prioritizes investment projects so that capital can actually be allocated to the best uses. So the so actually zero interest rates is not a good thing. Low interest rates is not a good thing. Higher interest rates are a good thing for allocating investments to the right kind of productive uh, uh, activities that increase real wages, that increase productivity, that lower inflation. So so it, so it so there's a tension between wanting a lot of investment because with low interest rates and wanting the right kind of investments with high interest rates and striking that right balance is really critical for monetary policy right now and, and, and also for fiscal policy. And by the way, uh, to say what uh, amplify a very important point Richard said, that the weaknesses of the last uh, 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 crises were due to the weaknesses in the global financial system and we've tried to patch those and not successfully. The weaknesses in the political system, multilateral as, and other institutions, is the core basis of the current crisis because it's taken the war in Ukraine that disrupted supply chains and amplified it into a, a huge global crisis on inflation and, 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 and recession concerns that, that really have to be addressed. And, and we are now facing a geopolitical crisis that requires reforms in the major multilateral, financial, uh, multilateral institutions like the IMF, World Bank and, and United Nations needs cooperation. Well, on that note, we conclude today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.